Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Online Festival. I'm Torin Barrera, uh, reporting from the Technology and Applied Composition Program here at the Conservatory. Uh, the Technology and Applied Composition Program at San Francisco Conservatory gives students a direct path into the world of film scoring, game audio, and other interactive media. Um, it features instruction from some of the most visible composers in the industry today, bridging art and technology. And today we have, uh, once again, the amazing privilege of uh, Austin Wintry joining us. Um, he's going to be uh, uh, giving us a masterclass um, on a variety of his works that he's been uh, uh, producing over the past five five years, I think. Um, Austin oh, uh, is a uh, composer for film as well as video games. Most notably, uh, he composed the soundtrack for Journey, which was one of the first video games nominated for a Grammy. Um, he's also worked on uh, enormously popular video games such as Assassin's Creed, The Banner Saga, uh, and we're thrilled to have him back for an encore uh, masterclass performance and really thankful for everybody that could uh, join with us here today. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat on uh, YouTube, and I'm going to uh, turn things over to Austin. Austin, how's it going today? Very well. I might even have uh, successfully functioning outputted audio so that we can do this properly and not sort of faking it through a combination of quick time and actual DAWs. <laughs> yep, I know, it's crazy. I, I love when, I love when, in fact, I've been doing a podcast um, with this uh, amazing trio of, of uh, folks, an, an actor, a game director, and a, and a journalist slash sort of um, like reviewer, critic, YouTuber, uh, and the four of us just kind of talk shop about the industry. And the first like three episodes we recorded, for some weird reason, I always had audio problems. And so it was like, of the four of us, it's the least excusable that I would have bad audio delivery when when doing the podcast. So internally, it became known as winning winning an Austin Wintery if uh, your audio sounded like shit. So what I love is that similarly, it's taken us about seven consecutive hours, but now we're finally dialed in. And uh, this thing that should have been second nature is... Um, actually working now yeah we're rearing to go what uh what are you going to uh, be showing us today austin well pending of course uh interjections from our council of faces i see in the zoom uh window i am planning to walk through a few different scores uh of mine all games with one uh additional that i'd love to show if i have time uh, but but I'm going to focus on stuff that I think is representative of the kinds of feedback that I've been giving in the in the lessons uh, Friday and, and this morning. It seems like there's been a lot of recurring questions about just the intermingling of of elements, the so-called hybrid scoring, uh, and uh, in which we blend electronics and maybe manipulated audio and uh, pre-records, and then obviously acoustic recording, whether it's a soloist, or a big orchestra, a choir, or whatever. So I went and grabbed, I went frantically digging in our lunch break through some old hard drives to make sure I had the stuff I needed uh, to go so I can actually pull up some sessions and show you at least a glimpse. The process can get pretty elaborate sometimes, and so there might be things, that, or there for sure will be things I gloss over a bit quickly, but uh, assuming that's all right, I figured I would start with the most recent. I was, I was uh, talking a little bit on Friday about this game, I'm, I'm literally still finishing the Pathless, but because this one is unusual and I've been given the green light to be sort of transparent with it, I'm I'm sharing things openly in a way that normally would be highly forbidden. Uh, so, with that said, um, the the I played on Friday the theme as sort of used in the initial launch trailer. Uh, which I assume is vaguely familiar sounding, and no one was completely zoned out uh, do, while during that. Partially is fine, but fully means we're at a disadvantage. And so that piece, uh, the, the tune of it goes like this. Can you hear my piano? Um, the tune is very, <laughs> I like the little emoji uh, thumbs up that appears. Um, the theme is very simple. It's very, very um, 
simple kind of almost like a folk song, you know. And so the rendition that I played and kind of gave a very quick and dirty rundown of is uh, not the one that's going to appear in the game. It was done as kind of a test um, and, and then, of course, also um, adapted into the trailer. So I, I've never actually shared publicly anywhere the, the version of the theme that is actually going to go in the game and on the soundtrack album and all that. It's very much the same piece, but it's been almost three years since I wrote that first version and there's been a lot of revelations and a lot of recording and the palette has gotten very refined. So you all, you can see my screen, right? You can see my, my DPM scrolling up and down through. So the score, first off, I should close this because we never use uh, brass um, except for a few uh, specific cues. Um, also, this has a little insight for how I tend to do templates. I have a very standard generic template that has kind of a fairly wide cutting um, orchestral palette uh, set up for it because that takes the longest to set up. So my, so my standard template, unless I'm starting from scratch because I know I'm not going to need any of that, in which case I just literally open up a blank DP file and start adding contact instances or, or Vienna Pro instances. Just since I'm talking to composers here, just a quick insight that you can see that I've got, you know, a winds folder, a brass folder, and these are just kind of generic. Uh, uh, I mean, they're carefully constructed, but they're also meant to be very multi-useful. So like I have, for example, the Berlin winds uh, is what I lean on primarily sample library wise for my woodwinds. And so I have their, the, you know, their flute one, their flute two, et cetera, et cetera, loaded in. Um, in on I have two different PCs custom built for hosting samples that are outside of my Mac. So I run Windows and and use um, like a virtual desktop uh, program to basically be able to manipulate the samples on the PC without ever actually having to turn and go over there. It's all disconnected right now because I'm just in audio playback, so I won't be triggering any MIDI. Uh, but you can see I have kind of th that folder. Uh, a brass folder. I do have the 10 horns, um, which I, I really just use these two channels uh, for it. And, and these are all set up with um, not key switching, but controller data switching, just FYI. So all the articulations route to the same MIDI channel so that it resembles the conductor score a little more closely. Nothing terribly adventurous or innovative about that, but then just a few additional libraries that I use to beef up the sound. Like this 10 horns one I use purely as a doubler, just so that the mock-up can kind of hold its own because it's amazing how 40 mock-up horns don't sound as big as four real ones. And I'll never understand that because the, the sample is also real horns, but just, I don't know, must be the way I mix my mock-ups. You can see I have a, I have a, I have a, uh, a variety of percussion with a premium on more intimate hand percussion type sounds. That's definitely the direction that this score went. And then I have, um, you can see over here, I've got mallets uh, grouped in here. Some of it gets a little lazy and messy. There's also plenty of channels here that I never ever use, and I just keep them there because it's I don't I don't because I don't know I'm too busy writing to clean up useless channels. So for example, piano I never once ever use piano in this score, um, and part of it is I leave it in the template because I get used to eyeballing I, I get used to seeing this gap there, um, and so if I you know this channel here that's um, that's all highlighted now. Like if I were to see MIDI data here, it, I would immediately, without knowing, I just ping that there's something in the wrong spot because I've trained my eye in this project to always see that as blank. And there's a handful of those throughout. Like I never once used vibraphone either. And so that's just another one of these spots that it just, it just sits there empty. Um, I also don't use choir or harp strings. Um, I do have divided up a little bit more um, I don't use, this is not a string heavy score, although you can do, you can definitely see that there's some string action going on. Um, and I do have a, a separate uh, subfolder for ensemble patches, just purely for the mock-up in case I need it. I don't think I ever use them in this. And then I do have this very odd uh, collection of soloists that I sort of sussed out through the course of the writing. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of things like um, like my friend Kristen Nagus uh, has uh, a bunch of samples uh, automatically assigned her out of the gate. There's a few things that I keep as samples like this harmachord 
is uh, I, I, I tweak the sample and I have it treated through the audio pipeline and I end up just keeping it as is. Things like the nickel harpas, those are, those are, I recorded, I, I basically recorded all of this. Um, and, and then I have a few basic placeholders for the uh, ensemble of throat singers uh, and Tuvan musicians that I use, the Alash ensemble. The fact that you see a second folder that duplicates that is a little bit of a teaser on how the interactive systems worked uh, because I basically needed to be able to easily mute and unmute all these MIDI channels uh, even though it's the same because it used to be in the old days like if you go and open my journey um, folders, uh, the DP files for journey, I would very often, I, I, I just was figuring it out as I went and so you would look and it was like for a print pass, it would look like this with just this checkerboard of and I would I'd have to write everything out. I'd get so paranoid, like, did I remember, was the shofar che checked or not on that last print? And it was horrible. It was a horrible way to work. Um, and I basically don't use synths in this score either. Uh, I, there was a couple of Omnisphere patches in there that I basically don't use. And then this is just part of the old template that's not, it's just generic. I never actually use these this way. Uh, I would always rename them and assign other things. And just, again, since I'm briefly talking shop, I showed this a little bit before, but um, the way this is all coming in is here's all my uh, Vienna instruments that are breaking out. So like I have buses, I they're all filtering to the woodwinds, but I could actually separate and print individually if I wanted uh, all the different subcategories so that I could theoretically print like a thousand tracks at once and have every instrument almost down to the individual instrument uh, printed just as in a single stem pass um, if I wanted. But for now, you can see like all the winds are just going to a wind. And you can even see it's even one more where there's a send to the wind reverb, which there's just uh, some placeholder stuff there. Uh, it was all recorded. So this is just for the mock-up, but it was passing through. I had originally, apparently, Altiverb and Renaissance verb from Waves and replaced it with uh, a little bit of my my latest my latest favorite in terms of this kind of thing the uh, FabFilter Pro R which is a very CPU minimally very light on the CPU uh, but surprisingly attractive reverb in kind of the algorithmic lexicon flavor although it's not that good uh, so anyway I have all these that are sending the signal and then it's all being bussed up here uh, oops went too far up here to the various mock-up stems so. Assuming it works, I can play. Uh, well, let me just play the real thing. I'll just skip past the mock-up because who cares? So down here, the way it works, these are all my prelay stems up here, looking very colorful and exciting. Uh, and these actually are color, color. Uh, coded where as mentioned this score i that's why i laugh at the notion of it being a, a, a um um the the term hybrid because what isn't uh and this score is no exception so as an example just running from top to bottom you see i have uh mock-ups of a lot of different things that I keep in there and I deliver it to my mixer purely as a reference in case there's a question or if something gets misplaced as we bounce back and forth between digital performer and Pro Tools, um, there's always this risk that things might get lost somehow or, or put in the wrong bar or whatever. Um, and so I have everything um, uh, redundant that is being recorded just as a precaution. I don't think I've ever once needed it, but as one of the recurring points earlier um, from Friday, talking about copying, there is no such thing as over-preparation. It's just not a thing. It, 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 if, you're, if you think you're over-prepared, you're under-prepared. Uh, so just keep going. Uh, so like uh, here at bar 14, I can see I've got some activity in my wind mock-up. Little bass clarinet and contrabassoon in unison. So the real ones of those are going to be down below. Uh, strings automatically stem out because I reverb and and EQ separately. High strings from low strings generally just as a default state in my mock-up, depending on what I'm doing. So like this little bit at bar seven. 
you know, we've got this big crescendo. You can see everybody here. Doesn't sound very big in the mock-up because I told you before I spend so little time on my mock-ups. And then here's the uh, low strings of that same section, which also has a, a bass solo. Um, and such and such on and on. Um, the percussion in this score was a combination of um, some samples with solo percussion that I tracked here in LA with ensemble percussion that was tracked at Abbey Road. Uh, so there's all three of those coalescing at various places. Same thing with mallet stuff. Uh, these are like, I use a lot of kind of crystal glasses and it sounds like that. Uh, generally speaking, most of those stayed as samples. I did experiment a little bit here and there. Um, and then all these various soloists. Um, and then down here is the many, many layers of my beloved Alash Ensemble, um, where I sat and I jammed with these guys in Washington, D.C. for six hours and generated, li like literally we, we hung for the day. I got six actual hours of recorded material a year ago. Uh, Cause I, by that point I already knew what all does this score, like where all does it go in terms of the different types of gameplay, all the different sort of areas of the, of the world, uh, the things the character goes through, cutscenes. I had a, even though I hadn't written everything yet, I had by that point after two years, I knew sort of what the, the map of the score was gonna look like. And so I knew certain things I needed to cover. So then I literally just sat in a room and jammed with these guys and they, they all play a variety of instruments and they all sing. And we, so we recorded as a group, but everybody was close mic'd. So I have all these different, and I, and I also did a tremendous amount of manipulation in many cases. So I'm sending it to my mixer with my treatment already applied. So just like sampling a few here, um, there's one one of the guys uh, <laughs> these guys are so amazing um different one yeah it's so what you're seeing is the benefit of already all my edits and everything um in fact this folder this one labeled raw is where i cut up everything in pro tools and and then exported it back into dp and so i'm i'm manipulating like body was one of the three guys for example like here here's one little snippet of his and then I've you know just you can see I'm just applying a little bit of reverb to it in some cases yeah here's some compression here's one where I'm actually uh where did it go yeah this here I'm actually pitch shifting him I don't remember why probably just moving him a half step somewhere other than where he sang it initially because that particular plugin is no good after a half step um and um so you can see here, uh, up through here, bar 44 and change is the presentation of the main theme. Um, so that's kind of a tour of the of the primary elements, um, and I'm just gonna play it. And let me slide over the piano roll. So hey, look at that, practicing what I preach. Very naked presentation of the melody up front.
I love hearing things like them breathing and hear, like, we talked a bit about that, I think on Friday, that, that I love that you kind of hear them, you hear them actually performing and it's not so manicured and sort of uh, uh, cleansed of all of its humanness. Uh, so as you can see, there's a real difference uh, if you remember how it sounded. Uh, it's the same tune for sure, same harmonies and everything, and even featuring the nickel harp is still and, and some of these other like the, 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 um, the pipa and the oud. And there were certain instruments that I had already figured out even from day one, two and a half years ago. But um, it, it definitely moved away from an orchestral sensibility. Uh, pretty, I mean, other than those strings coming in, it's, it's more like this bizarre chamber ensemble from places from dotted all around the world. I called it my, my global jam band because there's huge swaths of the score that feel very kind of um, semi-improvised. They're, they're actually not, but they're meant to feel that way. Um, and so you can see why I kind of laugh when the term hybrid comes up because it's like, well, what do you call this? The, so many of the elements in here are very treated and very, you know, like the, for example, when Kristen comes in, my, my, my beloved Kristen, um, on a combination of like the Zhao, um, which is kind of a, almost like the Chinese version of a Bansuri. And then also on, um, let me find the channel. Some of these are not entirely correctly labeled. Um, she also comes in on like a penny whistle. Um, you know, there's recorder also. Um, let me see here. You know, when you listen in context, uh, oh wait, I was playing the wrong, well, it's the wrong cue, but it's the same idea. Uh, when you hear it in context, um, there's so much reverb on the high, the high wind. There's obviously nothing acoustically performable about the way that that sounds. Like the notes themselves are not acoustically impossible, but um, it's 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 you're you're crafting a specific sound, and so that's why to me even the most so-called acoustic piece um, is is inevitably tinkered with. So, any uh, questions on this one from from my gang here? Uh, uh, specifically about this or the path list before I shift to something from years ago. Um, yes, feel free to unmute and ask away. Okay. Well, I guess as a fellow woodwind player, I guess just more about like how you're treating Christian specifically and like how typically do you treat your woodwinds if you're getting like a live performance and you're adding it to your mock-up or... Right. It depends so very much on the specific wind like remember there's Got this it. um uh bassoon and contrabassoon and bass clarinet so if you listen to those in the final mix um i didn't do anything with them i just recorded them literally here in my studio i've got this slightly off camera i think uh neumann uh tlm 49 i recorded both of them with that um and then it the the true mixing of it happened at my mixers studio steve kempster and he's got you know many different uh whether it's uh, outboard gear in the form of reverbs um you know like the, the lexicons which are still just so so standard bearing and so beautiful oh but he also has this um, incredible pro tools rig that's just got every every plug in you and ten thousand things i've never even heard of i don't even know where he found them um and he creates he spends about a day before i arrive you know, building this pipeline. And so, and at this point now we've been working together for more than 10 years. 
that I don't even really get in there and investigate what all he's doing to the sound anymore because he we get each other and so he'll be playing with it. So the truth is, I couldn't even tell you what all he did to the sound, but it but it but he he mirrors my mock-ups uh, by and large. I try to make the mock-up not dictatorial of what to do because I want him to bring his own ideas, but it's a reasonable guide. Plus, obviously, it's also by that point been approved by the developer and we don't want to be wildly outside of it because then they're going to hear a final mix that's really different than what they're used to from the mock-up, especially in the case of a game where the mock-ups have been in the game sometimes for over a year and they're really used to how it sounds. Uh, so in the case of like the low winds, you know, there was that long held note. We tend to keep those pretty dry. Um, now it's obviously not dry dry but the the ratio is such that the tail is long but the sound i really like the buzz of both of those particularly contrabassoon. soon i want to hear that flutter the yeah. the physical shaking of it um and in contrast, you know, Kristen is um, like on the lower, it tends to almost scale, at least in the way this score has worked, where for something really low, um, I tend to have her a little on the drier side and the high stuff, I, I just pour it on. Uh, and I sometimes will also EQ it so that you don't even really hear the articulations and things as clearly. And it's just, it's almost like she's the reverb of some other instrument at that point. And you hear very little of the direct sound. It depends on the one. For the lower, especially the wooden instruments, uh, like the Zhao or the Bansuri, even the recorder to an extent, but things that are very breathy, uh, which the recorder definitely is not. I, I really like it to be a bit on the raw side also. <laughs> Kind of medium wet. Uh, it's not soaked. Um, whereas here, you see, here's one of those where even though there's only one channel, we're hearing two of her because, because I basically would say like, will you just basically track every line you see with your name on it with everything you've got, <laughs> and I'll pick and choose what I want to keep. Um, and it's not that I'm not that bad about it, but a little bit. Um, but you do hear you see the octaves appearing here. So yeah, to me, it's all about, that's really the counterpoint to, you can see the nickel harpas, I've got two of them in a kind of counterpoint on the melody below her there. Um, and so the whole point of kind of bathing her in reverb is to not pull focus from them. Um, So and making sure there's room for everybody to kind of ornament and decorate a little bit in their respective styles. And this is also one, because it's not terribly orchestral, I also tend to, I, I like a very naturalistic sound traditionally with orchestral elements, especially strings, but I gave them a little bit more of a mystical kind of uh, much more off mic, leaning, leaning heavily on the rooms and the surrounds and less on the close mics and then also a fairly generous helping of reverb. Uh, you see it's it's sort of like it's supposed to be sort of a magical presence but but also not pulling focus from the soloists same with the passage i played um, a minute ago where they're pretty they're pretty um, background by nature you know, 
normally I'd want to hear more clarity than that. Um, but it's not that kind of score. It's not, I don't consider this an orchestral score. Uh, makes sense? Is that yeah, um, totally. illuminating of anything or does it yeah. raise new questions? That was very helpful. Cool. Um, all right. Anything else on this one? Uh, uh, lest I just, shift gears. Uh, no, no, just briefly on that one. So when you're saying how you don't really spend too much time on your mock-ups, um, for those, like, you know, for like the nickel harpa sound and stuff like that, like how, how early are you reaching out to these musicians to just even record, just get something down just so you have that sound for the sure. developers? Yeah, well, I actually went and found a nickel harpa sample uh, for this one, um, funny enough. So I was able to, um, I was able to uh, mock it up actually reasonably accurately um, because I knew that that would be a problem. This is partly why I recorded all the throat singing a year ago because I had no good way to mock that up, especially with them singing uh, uh, based around poetry and things like that. It was, it was like, there's just not a chance. Um, and, you know, for some of the early tests, I had gone to this group's albums and just kind of ripped out some little passages and said, like, here is the sound of throat singing, just so you can kind of calibrate your ear. It will not be this. This is clearly me just cutting a thing. And it's, it's not organic. You know, it's not um, the real deal. Uh, that was the big issue there. So in that case, yeah, a, a full year before the score was set to be finished, was I... Um, recording those but the the nickel harpa you know we did him in phases but i had samples in fact while i'm talking i'm trying to pull up and find my mock-up of this cue i think it's this um you can hear it's not Same thing as last week where we were talking where your ear will naturally go to the most interesting part. So all you are paying attention to in terms of the nuance of is it live, is it a mock-up, is the singers. So it's it at a glance, you're like, that was a mock-up. Um and uh but then obviously, you know, when you when you stack them side by side, it's no contest. <laughs> Um, even element, even sim things as simple as the percussion, you know, like the, um, Abbey Road stuff, you know, percussion is one of those that you can get away with, but, but, um, but man, it's just, you know, like these, like, it's just, it's just such a difference. There's a cue here later. I'm probably not allowed to share, but it's, it's a fun little. Glorious folks in London, just so much fun to work with. But that, yeah, that's a, that's, you can actually, also you can see on this one that I recorded it and then they changed the scene. So there's great big music at it right in the middle of that cue. It's sort of Frankensteining it a little bit. Um, there's gonna be even more on this one, I already know. Um, here's the isolated composite of the Abbey Road folks on that cue. And then like the strings on their own. And then I was saying how before I use like some crystal bells and things. Just adds 
adding a little bit of spice. Nickel Harpa doing some sawing away. Kristen, of course. And then these. Uh... So these are all composite mixes. Like, so you're seeing, you know, it gets blown out and then boiled back down to some sub mixes. So, um, so yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that, that was very illuminating. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. Any other, anything else more on, uh, on this path list? Cause obviously this is the most recent, it's the freshest in mind and it's a moving target. I may change this stuff by the time the game ships. Like that's the fun thing here is you're actually seeing an actual work in progress. This cue I chose one that's probably pretty safe, and so it almost certainly is done, done, but there's nothing that actually requires it to be. I could easily go and rewrite and re-record the entire thing uh, before the game ships. Not likely, and I kind of hope that that doesn't happen, but um, so yeah, anything else on here? Because then I'm, otherwise I'm going to pivot. Um, yeah, just curious, which drums were you using? Like for samples? Or just like what kind of drums uh, oh, were recorded? Oh, sure. Um, the percussion that we recorded, let me see if I can find the actual, um, so for that passage, here's the actual percussion part that was used, um, that bit I was just playing at the end was this here. So we are leaning primarily on Puyli Sticks, Djembe, and Bauron. Um, and then inevitably, and then yeah, some Tycho, and the, we had these great big floor toms. Um, and then, um, but the fun thing is, I you remember I showed you a little bit of footage from the session, they bring like 20 times more instruments than what is on the score. Because what we'll do is I'll say, okay, um, can we do can everybody play the percussion one part starting at bar 357? play the Tycho part and let's just quadruple stack that line. And then, so everybody grabs a different sort of Tycho-esque or maybe literal Tycho. We had, I think we had three of them. So maybe it was like a, three Tycho's and, and a, a large Tom or even a bass drum played with sticks, things like that. Uh, and we grab that if I decide that's what I want for that passage or like the djembe, I say, can we, you know, do you have a conga uh, that we can do? Like, can somebody else, let's toss at the Puyili sticks and can you both play on the, the djembe part, perk four, you know, starting 356, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's why I said the recording sessions for me end up being the last stage of composition because I will let what happens in the room be that final little moment to make decisions or change things or vary things or say, you know what, screw it. I don't like that anymore. I'm, let's just get rid of the djembe part completely. I decided I hate it. And then so it'll just, we'll just tacit it and move on. And so it, it what you see on the page is, Definitely not the full story, at least in most cases, especially on a thing like this, um, where I, it's so much about the sound is the idea. It's 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 not really classically conceived where the notes on the page are the are the gospel. It's it's very much about what are the mics hearing, which is largely true of all scores, right? Because no one will ever know what the score looked like other than in this context, the gamers and or soundtrack album listeners will only ever hear the results of this process. And so that's all that I'm loyal to, really. Make sense? Um, cool. Uh, without any, I, I'm happy to keep answering questions. I, I love that there are questions, so I'm not trying to rush us along. Um, if there, you know, that's what I'm here for. So if there's anything else on this one, let me know. Um, just lastly, at least yes, for, for now would be, um, how soon, how soon did you all know that you wanted to use like throat singing for this game? Like, was that your decision and did you bring it to them? Like, Hey, check this out or. So have like? you, it was, so it was one of my earliest, um, it was, it was literally my first idea, I think, other than the, maybe the theme itself, the melody occurred to me, but, um, you, have you seen the, 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 like the artwork? Um, yeah, the, I've seen a bit of it. Yeah. So that's the character design, right? And um, this character, the hunter, right? So 
the principal inspiration for this is the Mongolian tradition of falconry. Um, and so it was like, the game is in no way Mongolian. Uh, it's just the fucking most beautiful photos. Um, um, the game is not Mongolian. Um, the size of these animals. Um, and um, uh, But uh, this was something that Matt, he just fell in love with it. And he started showing me photos like this. And I just thought, I just immediately was like, well, what would be cool is if we kind of pay homage to the origins. We're not trying to create something that's authentically any any culture, never mind Mongolia. I mean, because that's the only thing in the game that really drives from that. But it's the foundation of the character herself. And so I said, I, I would love if there is also a little bit of homage to that origin. But then the rest of the score wanders around the globe. Um, and so and then it also worked out that there's this um, chamber ensemble based out of Chicago that I've worked with. Um, a lot named the Fifth House Ensemble, who were doing a partnership with the Alash Ensemble completely unrelated to this. And they were doing a tour together. And so I was like, oh my God, I want to feature both ensembles. And, and so I, I kind of glossed over that, but there's actually all the bass solos are played by the co-founder of the Fifth House, Eric Snoza, who's their principal bass player. But then I also, instead of synth, um, let me see if I can find it really quickly. It might not be in this, um, it might not be in this particular queue that I opened up, but um, instead of synths, I actually wrote out a bunch of parts for Fifth House um, by hand during one of their rehearsals and I had them play it. And then I made pads out of just this amorphous thing that they did because I, I thought, you know, I'm really trying to avoid synths I can at least play you the raw recording of what that sounded like. I've got the actual chart for it somewhere down here because I literally just took it in a took a photo with my phone and then sent it to them. And then they played things like this, where I wrote these kind of slow moving aleatoric parts for all 12 or 13 members of the group. And that's just them in a rehearsal room in Chicago. Uh, and. I wrote, I just wrote a handful of gestures, had them record it in a few different sort of key centers. And then anytime I was like, I really need some kind of pad here. I just drag that file in and, and start time stretching it and doing sorts of things. And you have something very quickly that's synthesizer-esque, but is definitely not. It's, it's all starting from raw sound, which is, which is kind of something that I was committed to. So, um, Anyway, that's obviously a tangent off of how and why the throat singing, but um, but uh, but it started in part because of Fifth House. I, I started thinking to myself, where the hell am I going to find throat singers? And the funny thing is, these guys didn't speak English really a little bit, and I so I did a test recording with them um, when they were on tour uh, in New York. I just did a quick remote recording. I booked a studio in New York and chimed in over Skype, and I was trying to figure out the way to the best way to to write for them. And I had a few things, and then I realized I just need to be in the room with these guys. And so what I did was. We booked another session for about eight months later. I, I had their tour manager send me the list of all the cities they were going to be in. And as it turned out, they were going to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, on a day where I was going to be the day before. I was in Nashville recording uh, all those bases for Erica the day before. And so I was like, I'm going to be close to Washington, D.C. So I literally went from the sessions for Erica, jumped on a flight. The next morning, I was in D.C. with these guys. And we set up a studio where I was on my piano and on a keyboard and they could hear me, but it wasn't in the air. It was only in the headphones. And so I would say, can you give me a click at like quarter, like in this case, you know, quarter equals 68 or whatever. And, and then so the, you know, this click shows up and I just start going. Or whatever. And then they one by one just start playing with that and I'll look at I'll look at you know body and I'll, I'll go this and he starts you know just his, filling the room with glorious overtones and uh and uh and then you know I'll change course and I'd throw like curveballs at him and be like you know and I'd see them all look around each other and then like sort of lean to the side and shift tuning and and um 
and uh, playing all kinds of things, percussion, winds, all their various string, you know, instruments, you know, the, uh, there's one instrument, I'm blanking on the name of it, that's almost kind of like a Tuvan version of a banjo and, um, and their version of the Morin Kur, which is sort of the, the horsehead fiddle. Um, and uh, so then, yeah, we basically just jam for six hours. And there'd be times where I would just have them start playing like a folk song or something. And then I'd start riffing and then they'd start riffing off of my riff. And we just went back and forth and just made music where I knew generally where we needed to end up. But I also wanted to see what treasures would just emerge in the space. And just also, it was just a blast. Um, it was so much fun. And then, yeah, I ended up with this gargantuan because we literally just hit record and didn't stop till the end of the day. And so I ended up with this like 5,000 bar Pro Tools session. Um, and then um, I sat there and carved it up and carved it up and carved it up and, um, and um, made this massive library um, of, um, of everything that we got out of it, um, categorized by key center and uh, tempo you can see here. And since I had everybody tracked separately, you know, I could go and be like, okay, if I want E minor at 130 BPM, and this is his, this is the mic on his voice, although you can hear he's just playing at first. so beautiful it's so it's inhuman it's so bizarre it's right in front of you and uh, yet it feels like it's coming from just the room somehow it's like it's like it, it's so bizarre how when you look at their mouth it doesn't appear to be coming from their mouth it's just ambiently everywhere all at once it's like light all of a sudden it's just so cool um oh i see a question in the chat uh which library for nickel harpa oh, for the life of me i don't remember um, I, I could only find one if I remember. So if you just probably Google like Nickel Harpa VST, it's probably that one. Uh, it's pretty good, actually. It's pretty. It was pretty solid. Um, did the job. Um, let me see if this. Oh, this this the whole Zoom audio thing makes DP open super slowly. Um, but I'm gonna shift gears. Um, to Abzu, uh, go go jump back. Unable to locate movie. That's okay. Um, shark rebirth. Spoilers. Um, let's see here. Get rid of that. Um, so this is the big grand finale of the score. Um, just to give you a quick rundown, you can see this one, um, you can see it's actually that same old template, uh, but heavily re-engineered now for Abzu. Cause this was, th this was actually one of the first scores I wrote using this template because it's about six years old. And, uh, I'm, I think I remember, in fact, I do remember I, I was on a completely different rig at the start of Abzu and I had to pull everything over and just like what, um, uh, earlier when we were talking about, uh, I think, I think Roger, you were saying that you had basically to import all the MIDI and reconstruct everything from just raw MIDI. I had to do that on Abzu about a year into it on a handful of cues. Uh, so yeah, so for this one, you can see, this is the beginning of the finale of the game. Uh, the orchestra had two flutes, two clarinets and two bassoons. The oboe was, was all tracked separately. This was my first time working with Kristen. So she belonged on her own. And then this, obviously the oboe two is just there pointlessly. Um, percussion, uh, you know, mostly kind of, it's not a very percussion heavy score. So it's mostly, and in fact, all of it was samples. It was just because there's so little of it. Um, and then my, my seven harp ensemble, uh, and you can see the way I set them up was that they were in a half circle around the room. So harp four was kind of the concert master of the ensemble. Um, and so you can even see the panning. We had her, actually, it's more extreme here than in real life. She was basically dead center. Um, but if you look at the panning, you can see we make our way through the, oh, it looks like three and four were for some reason. I bet that's a glitch. It's an old file. Um, it's supposed to be a relatively even spread of harp seven. It was actually one starting on the far right was one. And so here in this cue, you can see, um, 
we start with with the single harp in the middle and then it widens and widens and widens and then you can also even see just from looking at it that it turns totally aleatoric and everybody stops playing a metered figure and it just becomes this mad giant beehive of activity um, and the exact same thing is happening with the orchestra the violins come in a few bars later um, and you can also see, remember how I was explaining on Friday, the notes I leave for my orchestrator, I was, I make a note here exactly is where it shifts to aleatoric. It's Cause sometimes it's hard to tell because I try to play it realistically in the mock-up where if they're, you know, and then I start to s speed up gradually, it can be difficult to pinpoint if you're just looking at the MIDI and you don't know it and you don't, you're not me. Um, and then here, you know, there's a, a little bit of synth. I particularly like this one. Popping corn. Very delicious. Um, and so here I have all my, um, these are the mock-up stems. So that was what you're hearing at first. Okay, and then this is the final recording. Here, the, the popping corn. You know, so it's just adding attack, basically. Here's the harps uh, on their own. You know, it sort of disintegrates as it gets louder. I, I suppose I could be showing you these as I, as I'm going through them. And then like the strings in Nashville. Um, and then we had the uh, Kristen. Sort of reaching for the stars. So I have, I don't remember, actually, honestly, it's been so many years. I don't remember why I have two different stems of that. You can see a lot of the automation that's shut off of especially when I go to make the soundtrack album I'm often doing tremendous amounts of stuff to change things um, and oh, it's not letting me expand there's too many channels um, but then the next part is where it really um, shows itself because this is where this is for those who've played the game this is the literally the big finish and um, this is the first time in the game where you actually really hear the choir as the choir so this is the first cue. And since there was a question before about kind of the nature of the different layerings and systems for how this works, you'll notice that that little intro is its own standalone cue. Here's the piano roll, just a great big diatonic cluster of voices um, with these just unbelievably great singers in London um, at air. What, that ha what happens is the player is falling and falling and falling and falling and falling and they come shooting up somehow from below and come exploding through water and then do a dive and fall back in. So this moment of like gravity flipping happens that's just super cool. And that leads into this. So that's a little stinger as soon as you hit the water and I timed it to be the exact amount of time that you hang in the air. And I asked developer like, can we can you time that to the cue basically? Like, can we, I'll time it to you. And then if it's off a little bit, can you just sort of refine it to match? 
um, so they can control the amount of speed that you start with. And since you can't, it's not a flying game, you, you have no control over how long you're going to stay in the air extra. Um, I was able to do it so that you land and then you pop in to the water and we trigger the first um, sort of little piece, which is also not a loop, but because there might be slight variation in the speeds of different systems, uh, you know, we want to trigger them independently. So one comes in right kind of in the immediate reverb tail. So a little choir intro. Yeah. Totally. Questions from Mary. Oh, uh, from Mary Claire's uh, <laughs> uh, audience. So then here is uh, you can see the first sort of loop, and you you actually can see I even made a note for Susie saying if there's time I'd love to record the strings and uh, winds separately. But I also knew we were going to have a jam packed recording session, and they're all in the room together. It might not be possible. In the end, I don't actually believe that we did get them separately. Um, but this first bit, um, the way much of this section works, it's like a series of, uh, it's like a big chain where each element is sort of interlocking with the, the, with the next. And you have to kind of unlock these big machines in order to move things forward. Um, and so, um, oops, the basic sort of composite of everything sounds like this. make the MIDI data very messy. <laughs> all that, uh, all that harp uh, r racing around. Uh, got all seven of them going there. If I mute the harps, uh, you can see what's left. <laughs> tuned bells and stuff, some of which is sampled, some of which was recorded, you know, so if I get rid of those. So the, string, the, the strings are totally tacit to start. Um, and then of course the choir. some alternate track and again for the life of me i can't remember if it was i i wrote it i wrote a, a quote of the theme and then i decided you know what i don't think it's necessary and so i didn't i don't think it's in there And so the way that this loops, in many cases, um, because I have everything stemmed out, um, I'm able to um, to remove uh, things. And I typically would remove the most melodic elements first. So like the choir, we immediately get rid of the choir. In case you get stuck or lost. way more forgiving. Uh, my my uh, 
harps, which sound like a giant sort of guitar. Um, you see, it doesn't feel like it's urgent. And, and we, we played around with a lot of things where, you know, the, the, we would play the full mix maybe twice and then loop back. And so it eventually wait, makes its way down to, to basically nothing. we get down to is basically the percussion and the tuned bells and stuff but then there was also this experiment where you can get uh like damaged you can get hurt uh at least it was a thing i remember we experimented with so i said wouldn't it be interesting if i do horrible horrible things to the choir and we actually quickly sort of make it disgusting um and so this Mary Claire, this is uh, this is my sound toys. Uh, uh, I don't know if she's even still here, but but in discussion of you know truly two of the most beautiful uh, plugins money can buy, um, just the best. And so um, so the choir sounds all nice, and then if you screw things up. So yeah, that was a running uh, recurring element throughout. So yeah, you can see it's actually relatively simple. So what happens is you keep making it, once you make it to the next area, um, you get these little short intros that, that come in right on the next beat. Actually, they come in at specific bars. Like I would go through with the, um, the, uh, with my partner in crime, Steve, and, you know, we would import this and have this set up within Wise. Or I can say, you know, on bar 49 and on bar 53 and on bar 57 or whichever, those are the bar, those are the transition bars that are possible. So when the player hits that, it begins like a one or two bar fade out, and then this starts triggering at full volume immediately. Actually, for the soundtrack album, I basically just put it in how it plays, but without all the contingency for extra passages and extra looping. So if you see down here, my these channels were my actually I think it's I think it's all these channels. Um, I just got lazy after only two because I'm you know full of integrity like that. Uh, the um, the album you can see is cut if I if I mute these and this theoretically should work. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is how I edited the album uh, from this. Um, you notice they overlap three bars. It's basically an exact duplication of how it works in game. But I did start getting a little bit more fancy with it as it got in because I wanted to create some mixes that you can't actually hear. Yeah, so like just narrowing it, narrowing it down. I didn't mean to have the most important part muted. Because I there's this whole passage where I've I put so much work into to you know how the orchestra is put together, and then uh, but the choir is still the dominant voice. So I thought, ah, what the hell? We'll just play that a second time and get rid of the choir. Recapitulation never hurt anybody. And then, 
Let's see here. What am I adding? A little. Oh yeah, I added a little suspended symbol that's not even in the score anywhere. I just purely for the album. Of course, it was muted again. And then notice the cue that's supposed to start it. I now end there. Uh, again, that's just subjectively making it work. Um, and also, as I recall, it's because we had to do something funny in the game as well. Things shifted around after I'd already kind of recorded the cues. And so I repurposed things. It's all up here. More of the, you can always, I always loved how you could just spot the harps a million miles away. Just glancing at the MIDI, there was just this giant beehive of activity. And you can see also how I, how I, I wrote it like a chamber ensemble, like the outer edges and the center are all in unison. And then the kind of middle left and right are playing chords. Uh, you see what I mean? How it's, it's conceived of with an ensemble sense. Um, I can play the, just that passage just to clarify what's going on here. Just the harps. Oop, forgot my. By the way, the pro tip here, I don't know how deep a dive you guys have d gone into harp pedalings. But if you want to write really kind of chromatically adventurous stuff, it can be a nightmare really quickly. Unless you have seven, in which case you just send the parts all over the place and you just make sure people don't have to worry about that stuff. you know, uh, like the, see the, the bells and stuff up here. So yeah, this became one of those scores where it's really, painting many, many layers on top of each other all the time. So yeah, that's, um, um, I just realized I was ignoring the chat, um, and uh, I see, yes, the, qu the question, Rahim's correct, it's, the, te the language is called Akkadian uh, from ancient Babylonia, uh, the text is the Enuma Elish, the, the oldest known um, uh, creation story in the world, a stone tablet that has sort of a, a early version of the uh, story of Genesis, essentially, from the Old Testament, um, and um, and uh, uh, sort of the idea of the gods sort of emerging out of the oceans from and, and crafting the world, um, and it was what Matt it was what inspired the name the name of the game, but also the the game itself. Um, and and then um, Roger's question I can answer most effectively. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Uh, 
Yeah. So here we go, flips at 193, four free, a nice hop and skip. Here it comes. It was definitely one of the most fun times I've ever had in a recording session. So yeah, you can see the... Uh... Orchestra in Nashville. Uh... We did the harps uh, and the choir. That was sight reading. Uh, I, I, it, I mean, sight reading in sessions in general always blows me away, but for for um, singers, um, it's just it's just mind blowing. Like the um, um, this kind of stuff. Of course, my my assistant Dallas, being the overachiever that he is, he has the original cuneiform here. In case you don't want to read the translation. Basically, and did one like one take of the whole piece, and then we're like, okay, let's just pick up some spots. And I was like, dear God, uh, it, it's just—I mean, it's—I'm used to—I'm used to orchestras doing that, but this is not easy choral writing. Like, so especially also, there's no bases, so it's kind of there's no foundation that they're used to uh, standing on. And anyway, it was—it was a joy. Um, that's 49 pedals in one room. And like forty thousand strings. Uh, so uh, I, I'm realizing it's after three. So I want your guidance. I was going to share. Also, I have queued up um, Assassin's Creed Syndicate and no, also keep, Banner Saga three stuff. Let's keep going, um, Austin. This is this is really great stuff, and I I, th I think you're on a roll. Um, we've uh, I've been speaking with the students, uh, and we've kind of adjusted the schedule through the day. So yeah, please please carry on with this. We're, we're okay. All... So where wh what does that result in in terms of? Um... Uh, we'll keep going till four p.m. Uh, if you can fill okay. until four, great. Uh, does it in... seem like that will be a challenge? Uh, I uh, <laughs> this is this is uh, this is too much fun. So yes, no worries. Uh, okay, cool. Well. So um, I had a few. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this one. Um, no, I do not wish to save. Um, for Assassin's Creed, I thought it would be fun to share some of the um, combat music um, uh, because there was a lot that went into this. Um, and there's just so much of it. And so one of the first things I'll mention, I don't know if you're, I don't know how if the screen share goes all the way to the top of the frame, but the file that just loaded is called conflict three. Um, and what that means is that I wrote three giant batches of combat music for the game because um, the, the open world nature of it always, it always bugged me that um, it looks like it's automatically going to zoom still but i'll have to test it and see if it's working um when it's an open world game uh for those familiar or i suppose i should say for those not familiar with ac the way the way that it works um is that you wander around and you find these missions and you go do them and you're just in victorian 1860s london pretty incredibly realistically recreated practically brick by brick i mean it's just it's huge it takes like hours to to explore even close to all of it. And um, 
And so because you can wander around and get into fights and get into all kinds of mayhem all the time, it was uh, troubling to me. I should say the challenge presented itself to make sure that the music is never just constantly repeating the same stuff. If I get into a fight, I don't want to hear the same fight music over and over again. And especially if I've been playing the game for an exceptionally long period of time. And so um, it always irritated me in typical open world games where you would have um, just kind of like stand in combat music. Like just that's what we're doing now. We're in combat mode. And so I said, can we attach the combat to this, the core narrative story mission progression? So we kind of, for lack of a better way to do it, there's nine basic missions and we divided it into, into three groups of three. And after you finish the third one, all the combat music in the game vanishes and gets replaced by slightly more advanced combat music. And then if you, and then, and then you could spend the next hour doing nothing but core story missions, or you could spend 20 hours doing all these side missions and, but you're like in act two now of the story. And so your combat music is going to get pinned to this. It's not a perfect system because let's say that after five missions, you're now in act two, and then you decide, I just want to spend the next 30 hours exploring the game. You're going to end up stuck in that act two music a lot. Although we did do other things. Uh, for example, we developed an algorithm with the programmers where if you are upgrading your gear and upgrading your character a lot, which you can do in the open world because you just you get EXP as you get into fights and uh, advance your character and you have the chance to buy more gear and all this sort of stuff, your character's threat value goes up, which means your sort of damage potential relative to enemies. And so the system is constantly measuring how big a fight, how big a challenge is the given encounter. And if you don't meet, meet some minimum amount, it won't trigger music at all. So that as you get better, easier enemies are sort of not worth your musical attention anymore. And it was a way to also mitigate obsessive constant amounts of looping. It also meant that if you came up and you just assassinated somebody and it didn't aggro enemies, it doesn't even count that as a fight. And so it doesn't even begin to ask the question of if you are uh, of a proper threat level. Um, this one, you can see, uh, same thing as before, all my mock-up stems uh, are and, and the live recordings that I did myself are all up here. I don't remember which cue is which here. This is getting a little old now. Okay, so yeah, I remember I told you guys, I warned you about my horrible mock-ups because I had to use all solo string, um, uh, solo string libraries for like the whole thing because the whole score was written for um, three violins, three violas, three cellos, two flutes, two oboes, two trumpets. Um, in this case, the oboes and flutes are, they're in act two only. So this is now, and, and trumpets are only in act three. So you will find those. And then the green here, if I remember correctly. Um, okay, the green was Sandy Cameron and the blue is Tina. And so you'll see the way it's written is, let's say, where's my mock-up? Violin mock-up. So let's say I'm playing as um, Evie, the sister. The, the, the combat starts like this. We accidentally grabbed a live Sandy. So it's, it sounds kind of like an extended intro. Everything here other than the green line. Do you love that they let me get away with pizzicato for combat? This is this is like breaking bones and and uh, but I said I said it should always feel like the characters don't actually believe the enemies are a threat. They're both these arrogant pricks who are like you would dare? Are you that stupid that you would come up against me? So it's like in response, I give you dancing pizzicato just to show you how little I respect your your danger potential. Uh, I didn't think Ubisoft was, was going to go for it, but they liked it. And then you'll see my really bad, this is before Tina released her own library. I think it's the Embertone cello, but I put very, very little effort into making these mock-ups sound good. Ugh, I can't, I can't, I can't handle it. So let's mute that forever. Um, so then that same passage, 
with the actual notice by the way for those paying attention um you also get no sense of the bowing and the articulation but if you caught it i actually um wanted not i don't want all those separate notice the bowing at the end of beat two so we still have Sandy Tasseted because we're playing as Jacob. section so you see so but in contrast obviously if i if we were playing as as jacob fry instead of evie fry we get the opposite part sort of makes more sense, but it didn't feel fundamentally broken before, especially because bear in mind the player's busy focusing on not dying. Uh, now this part is blank. Like, I mean, not blank, but you know what I mean? There's no cello. So we proceed through the whole, and then there's these, you know, these interstitial, what happens is the system is saying, did you, did you win? Um, and we start to move into this cool down. So this is basically giving us five bars to determine if the fight is over or if more people are coming. Um, this before you'll notice was labeled low, uh, conflict set one low. Uh, if it was a more dangerous fight out of the gate, a similar piece, but it's slightly more energetic and slightly kind of busier. And... Question a little more busy. That's the handoff to 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 uh, Evie if we're playing as Evie, and obviously it's not possible in the game to ever unless you're switching back and forth right at the correct moment. You'll never hear the cello and violin pair off like that. It's always going to be just one or the other. I, I never I never actually write for Tina in cello range because she just sings up in that tenor and soprano. <laughs>
very simple kind of Alberti. Um, and the idea is that if you get into these really, really long fights, this can go on and on and on and on. And because this score actually in, emboldened my nerdiness, I was like, you know what this needs is some kind of fugue because it's combat, why not? fun times it's a fun session musicians the fun thing is because it's literally just nine of them no one everyone was very exposed if it was like violin two that wrong note was you not someone in the seconds it was like literally you uh so and they felt it and this some of this writing uh especially if i jump to the later stuff um like let me see here some of it was pretty unforgiving. <laughs> It's actually a pretty um, simple, all things considered, um, score. Like the the, there's no real synths to speak of. Like there was a little bit of things hidden. Like right there, you almost can't hear it. Um, but this uh, right here. Um, to connect some phrases and then the percussion, like I said, I, I had to sequence all the percussion because even though our budget was really strong, there was just such an insane volume of stuff and I kind of put all my eggs in the session. It's also the percussion is actually pretty simple and minimal. Like you hear, you don't really remember it intentionally. It's just accenting and adding a little bit of beat. Yeah, 
this. See what I mean? Like this is about as pure a score as you can get. It's even meant to sound and feel like chamber music. Um, and yet um, it is uh, a hybrid score because everything is a hybrid score. <laughs> Um, let's see, it's in this last bit here. This is now, the way this works is it keeps, it basically the way the system would work is there's these cooldowns, as I mentioned before, where it's giving you a few bars to determine is, are there nearby enemies that are going to aggro and come after you. And so the cooldown is meant to be four or five bars that can then very, like on the beat, be interrupted and it sounds natural. So it's... Janky, but you see, it saw the idea is that it, 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 like, it's very easy. To, it's not even a crossfade. It's just triggering right on the next beat if there are in fact more guys coming. And so you have chain one to chain two to chain three, so that we can create a pretty big arc to combat if it's long enough to justify it. And then of course also with the difference of which character are you playing as. So as you organically go back and forth throughout the game, and since fights are not all the same length. And because you start gradually being more powerful than more and more enemies, the combat music and, of course, the fact that it's also uh, changing every three missions means that um, there's a tremendous amount of variety. And, of course, the music, the combat and stuff that's specific to missions um, is proprietary. That's a whole other separate session. This is just this one, this is just this one small portion of it. Um, so here's... Uh, Here's like the, the finale stuff. If I remember correctly, I even made it so that uh, if if you actually did wind your way to a proper ending like that, you couldn't re-trigger combat music for a certain minimum amount of time so that you didn't have this dum ba dum ba dum and it just like if a guy happens to run across. So it, it gave you this minimum cooldown where if you got into a fight, it would just have no music. We always opted for what would be the musically most satisfying because that is the most gameplay satisfying. Um, also, one of my little secrets that I always do is I always need effects for transitions, whether in music editorial or to help create stingers. So attached to everything in those key centers, I always just create a bunch of effects. And we just record them one by one. Things that are musically related to this section. And I don't, I don't know what their use will be until I need them. Uh, and sometimes I don't need them. This is something I started doing on the Banner Saga, and I, I've done it ever since. So you see, it's it's kind of like building a little sample library um, of stuff. So all these cues end with um, just sort of a, a, a bank of effects. Um, that I that I invariably end up using. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. A question from YouTube. 
In Assassin's Creed, there's a series of districts uh, that are categorized by difficulty level. Did you consider making a unique combat theme for each district? No, uh, we, we, we do lots of stuff which is district specific. Um, I don't know, let me see if I happen to have the ability to showcase. Oh, I totally do. Okay, awesome. Um, I don't remember which, I don't remember which one this is. Um, we're gonna see. Based on BK, I'm gonna assume that means it's Buckingham Palace. Um, and um, it's just a little too long ago, but, um, oh yes, Buckingham Rooftop. Okay, perfect. So um, the idea was not to make it regional. I don't like, I'm actually, I'm actually not really a fan of when games make things about location instead of making them about character and story. Because like, there's nothing about fighting in Buckingham Palace unless the game gives me a reason. Like it's a different type of enemy and one is related to the character's childhood and the other one is like an arch rival that's new in their life. If there's some narrative justification why something uh, that's endemic to this region is unique and separate from something that's endemic to another region. Unless I have something like that, I'm not a fan of like, here's the town theme or here's the, this, you know, Buckingham palace, or here's like the back alley number seven theme to me. It's, it's not satisfying. It, it is, it is, um, it is aiming for an element that's actually not really part of the player's experience or a part of the narrative experience, and especially on a game like this, that matters. But that said, there is a tremendous amount that we did, which was location specific. We just didn't make it in a way that would necessarily be obvious to the player. So one of the things is we opted out of uh, free exploration music. So if you're just wandering around the, seats, uh, the streets, if you only if you get into a fight will you hear music out in the open world. One of the, the two main exceptions to this, but they're, they're not just open exploration, are what we call the reach high points, which is the specific landmarks that you climb in order to do the synchronized move that gives you the, the unlocking of a region of the map. And then you do the famous leap of faith down into the conveniently placed hay bale at the bottom. Um, that is one of the things that triggers seemingly part of open exploration, except that the music is all about, it's a, it's a multi-layered system that sculpts your ascent and then the leap and then the aftermath of the leap. It's like nine cues inside of one minute. Um, and the cool thing was that those, because those are specifically built around where they are in the map, like you do a reach high point on top of Westminster Abbey, and then you do another one on top of Buckingham Palace. And it's specific to those. The audio director, Lydia, and I um, spent a long time choosing folk songs, famous, uh, well-known, of the era, uh, hymn tunes, folk song, like English folk songs, um, and um, uh, and um, sort of Church of England staples uh, from the the hymnals, in order to stylize each region. So, like something would be very posh and proper, and something that you might hear and associate with royalty if you're on top of Buckingham Palace. But then, if you're like right over the Thames, it's going to be a song that would have been sung by like fishermen. And we and we worked with a with a musicologist to source all these songs because they're also being sung in the game diegetically by characters like busking throughout the world. And the idea was that the way it works is I'll hear someone singing a famous tune. And then I go up and climb onto this rooftop and that tune actually gets swept into the score in this beautiful cinematic way. So the way that we did um, the rooftops, which is the other thing is you, you go up on the roof and it, the system basically rolls a die. And if the die comes up, you know, positive, and we changed the percentages as the game goes on so that you kind of can concentrate how often you might hear this cue versus you might not. And, and then ab as you've heard it, we start to take it away. And on top of that, as you can see, here's the, the cue for daytime. And then there's the separate, totally different, but same material cue if it's nighttime. So there's a lot of variation built into this. Um, also, I have here um, there were vocals performed by a soprano named Holly Sedios, um, and I took text from Nahum Tate's libretto to the um, uh, Henry Purcell opera Dido and Aeneas, and I took a bunch of libretto from there, and I, I used the text in my own melodies, and found I found passages that were kind of relevant to where you were within the mission progression, and I can't remember which one this corresponds to. I guess I guess based on my um, 
my naming here, uh, 07, this is attached to Mission 7, which means that if you go up on the rooftop of Buckingham Palace before completing Mission 7, you will never hear the vocal. You will only hear the piece like this. There's the, the wonderful little tune that was chosen by Lydia. These are obviously way more atmospheric and way more kind of... And then in contrast to that is, uh, if you're there at night, Oh, damn it. Stand by. The stop share is directly next to my, <laughs> here we go. Let's move this back to the top of the screen. Uh, here's the night version. It's, you know, darker and more kind of moody. Oh, it's all well and good, but let's say I've actually completed this mission. Then it rolls the dice and I come up positively and it gives me vocals. different from the daytime, like slightly more. They're both a little dark because we're getting towards the very end of the game and it's sort of like things are sort of in a default state of shittiness and uh and uh desperation and so you know versus if you compare this to the rooftop cues of you know missions one two three four that it's it's much more um overtly kind of a folk uh a setting of a folk tune basically um so yeah those were those were actually regionally um derived um and while i'm on the um the subject of the of AC, and then I can I can shift to one last thing if I don't run out of time. Are there any questions about any of that? By the way, I I, I don't want to presume. Uh, rather, you don't need to presume a stopping point on my part. Feel free to obviously just jump in. I know you know that, but I'm just goading you on in case you're retreating into your um into your uh, hovels. I wanted to share one of the other things that was just absolutely one of the most fun uh, aspects of this project was, of course, the fact that we had to write also um, a bunch of diegetic source music that would be performed in the game. Uh, and as you finished missions, there would be like characters. The idea was that some mythical composer uh, could, um, um, 
he could hear, uh, uh, he would see rather that some mysterious robed figures are running around and, and changing the balance of power in the city. And so decided to write a song about it. And so the whole notion was, you know, what if there's source music that's literally commenting on what just happened, but from the perspective of someone that wasn't there and probably doesn't know the story exactly correct. Like imagine if you were writing a song right now about the coronavirus or like about you know, what it's like inside the CDC. You know, it's like you read the headlines, you know stuff's going on, but you're not there. So there's probably going to be some details that are inaccurate or maybe you're just taking liberties. That was the similar idea that, that, that uh, there's this, we would write six songs that are just in the world. It's the only time ever where this was literally my deliverable, except I made a, I made a lead sheet uh, instead. The, this is a transcription of one of the of the performances that was just sort of improvised based on the lead sheet and with my beloved brethren tripod in australia these three amazing singer songwriters that i just love as brothers we were doing a show together at the time which i was going to be the last thing i showed you guys for fun because it's just so unlike anything else i've done it's, it's almost like a orchestral musical um and they uh, I said, I'd love to write the songs with these guys. Um, and so after there's this one character um, named Maxwell Roth, who hires the two of you. Uh, and then he starts kind of going crazy and then he becomes your target. And you're like, okay, this guy was helping us, but now we, we got to take him down because he's obviously very dangerous. And so you have to bring him down And the big kind of boss battle where you fight him is this cue that I call Darling What a Night. And it's, you can hear it's very sort of galloping and ridiculous and theatrical. You, know, you get the sense it's like a boss battle from with a crazy person. So it's sort of galloping and funny and weird. And so after writing that, it was like talking to um, the uh, Tripod Boys, like, okay, we got to write a song about this guy. And, and they, this was one of those where I played for them the general idea, and then they were just kind of doing their thing. Down, they're all down in Melbourne, Australia. And so then one day they just sent me this file and were like, here's kind of our variation on the stuff that you were doing. Um, and we wrote, you know, some material. And they, they sent me essentially this, and I was like, I got, I got nothing to say. I, I, I was planning on getting in there, and, and but they, they basically wrote this. And so I, my role on this particular piece ended up shifting to being that of a producer uh, because I obviously still had to record it and, and piece it all together. And um, and so the, the, the transcription you see is from the recording session that I did uh, for the piece, um, which was expressly for the soundtrack album um, uh, because I was like, it's just, I just need a version of it that's sort of how I want it. And because all the other versions were sort of drunkenly and stuff by in world characters on the streets. Um, but so this was, um, this is where this one ended up. And, and try to follow along the lyrics because good God, are these guys amazing. Uh, it's just the best. Of Maxwell Roth, he sought the footlights like a moth, his sense of timing never off until he opted to collaborate with a hooded reprobate, the blighter and assassin made a deadly double bill. Jokes, 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 make them laugh until they choke, fairly slay them in the aisles, maidens fair and princes charming. Thrills, 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 dashing feet and bloody spills, and I guarantee you'll never see the ending coming. Rose, the scene was set, they danced a murderous duet, and much deserving blood was let up to. 
the scene wherein they disagreed on who should live and who should bleed and Maxwell Rothy then received a very bad review. Jokes, jokes, jokes and there's daggers and there's cloaks but behind the scenes the leading players differ on the plot. Laugh, laugh, laugh at the dandy's new red scarf now eight shows a week to peel some up is his eternal lot. Jokes, jokes, jokes make them laugh until they choke fairly slay them in the aisles. Fate's fair and Prince is charming. Thrills, 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 dashing feet and bloody spills and I guarantee you'll never see the ending coming. So that, I mean, come on, can we all just reflect for a moment on, on laugh, laugh, laugh at the dandy's new red scarf. Mind you, 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 you cut these guys throats to bring them down at the dandy's new red scarf. Now eight shows a week to Beelzebub is his eternal lot. Fucking unbelievable. I couldn't do that with a gun to my head. They are, they are just the best. So now I will share with you something which I have never shared other than if you happen to be in the audience when we did it. Um, at a performance with the Adelaide Symphony, I, saw I decided to go absolutely bonkers because I figured, well, I got an 80-piece orchestra here. Let's see how this could translate in a way which would never, ever be right for the game. I don't know if it's even worth attempting to put this score on the screen, but uh, you'll get a sense of it. Attend the tale of Maxwell Rothy fought the footlights like a moth His sense of timing never off until He opted to collaborate with a hooded reprobate A blighter and assassin made a deadly double Jokes, 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 make them laugh until they choke Fairly slay them in the aisles, maidens fair and princes charm Thrills, 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 dashing feats and bloody spills And I guarantee you'll never see the ending coming The curtain rose, the scene was set They danced a murderous duet And much deserving blood was let up to The scene wherein they disagreed On who should live and who should bleed And Maxwell Rothy then received a very bad review Jokes, jokes, jokes And there's daggers and there's cloaks But behind the scenes the leading players differ on the plot Laugh, laugh, laugh At the dandy's new red scarf Now eight shows a week The fields of love is his eternal life. Jokes, jokes, jokes Make them laugh until they choke Where they slay that was our encore we did at a show together it was so fun uh yeah totally just mayhem and i couldn't resist a key change at the end there as cliche as that might be uh so yeah assassin's creed the musical kind of that's the thing what we what we did we did a whole show together um um just like they got they got asked by the melbourne symphony a few years ago five years ago now to do a show about gaming um all so we call it an orchestra cabaret show because it's basically just a succession of songs except instead of like them on guitar it is the entire orchestra and and so we spent a year writing this show it's literally it's like a two-hour show and so i can i can i have reached a fork in the road to end here, um, I can share with you um, if because that's just fun and it's a total change of pace. We can go down that road, and I can I can pick something from there to share with you guys. As an alternative to that, um, I also have queued up and ready stuff from Banner Saga Three, which is obviously sort of uh, directly applicable to studies and uh, uh your your coursework and all that kind of stuff and and it represents in a similar vein to assassin's creed but even more um hybrid scoring but which is overwhelmingly built around the ensemble in the room and i've got all kinds of you know tricks that i did on that um for that one so you guys here my my council of seven the seven for those of you that have watched the boys on amazon uh is uh you get to decide so banner saga or the show by the way is called this gaming life 
Um, and it's hilarious. And the Banner Saga 3 is obviously total depressing carnage and 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 uh, darkness. Banner Saga. All right, fair enough. No, no lightweights uh, in this crowd. Um, I love it. Um, okay, I actually pulled that one in here because I had to dig it off of an old hard drive. Um, <laughs> I forgot about my naming scheme. I always change the name of my soloists when I'm sending them MIDI data to track two. So Taylor Davis was Vete for violin Taylor, and Kristen Nagus at one point became K Nizzle. Uh, she's also Xtian, which is the thing that someone renamed her as. Uh, and so, yeah, I was looking at that going, what the hell are these files named? Tay. This is what happens when you're making things at, at uh, you know, four in the morning. Um, uh, a orchestra, which file did I open before? I want to make sure it's. Should be this one. So the way I organize the Banner Saga scores is tricky because the score, the game is, um, um, the score, the the game is broken into chapters, and it evolved a lot over the course of the three games, one, two, and three. Um, musicians know no light. <laughs> Accurate, as we all sit indoors, cowering from the outside world. Um, so uh, the. Um, the Banner Saga games, you can see how it's actually labeled. It's these are all whoop, these are all chapter 18. Uh, that was one of those things where it carried across all three games, where the first game I think ended at chapter uh, nine or ten or something like that. And then and then the second game was like eleven through eighteen or, or seventeen. I actually can't be right. I think the first one is one through six. Uh, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, uh, the final chapters are in this game. So it's like so they're kind of one giant game. Which we always knew was the aspiration. If the, if they sold enough copies, we were going to keep making until the full trilogy was done. Um, and so that's why I tended to just. Um, you can see I have the whole chapter, um, uh, with one exception I'll get to in a second, on a single, almost three hundred measure cue. And so it's not a three hundred measure piece. It's a bunch of cues, as you can see. It's eighteen M one, eighteen M two. Uh, 18M3 is not here, 18M4, and then the combat cues are 18MC1, 18MC1, Section 2, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll get into how that's all broken up in a second. Um, the reason why some of them are missing, by the way, like 18M3, occasionally I would write, I would mark down that there's going to be a cue there, and then what would happen is it turned out not to be needed, so I would just ditch it. But also, we had two different orchestras on this score. So you'll notice A orc and B orc, um, basically, not every cue needed the full ensemble. And so to save money, you book a separate session with the smaller group. This is standard. There's a lot of you know, big Hollywood films where that's where I learned that is, is sort of from film practice where you would do like your A orchestra is the full 90 piece group or whatever. And then you do however many days where you need that. And then you know, the B orchestra is like just you know, strings and winds and uh, string winds and brass, you know, for like lush, but but not action cues or whatever. I'm making it up, but as an example. And then like, let's say you have a few intimate cues of just strings, like transitions or whatever. You could do just a session of the strings and maybe even a lesser amount of them. And that way you're producing with your resources more efficiently. So it's something to remember, by the way, um, that, uh, you know, if you're anticipating, you know, average of five, six minutes of music recorded per hour, which is kind of a middle of the road number. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depending on variables like how good the players are and how complicated music is. Um, if you have 17 minutes of music and therefore you know you need four hours, even though the fourth hour is going to have barely any music spillover, like if it's a five minute per hour, so you get 15 minutes into the first three, that fourth hour is going to be, you know, maybe 20 minutes before you're done as a result you try to shed that session of anybody that's not necessary and it, and it can it can it can save you resources which makes your producers very happy so this first one you can see is a is a cut scene um, and, uh, and for those uh, those familiar these scores the thing that i tried on this which was fun is it's a it's a fairly large orchestra but there's no strings anywhere 
with the one exception of Violin, Violin Tay, Tay Tay, Vay Tay, uh, the YouTuber, Taylor Davis. Um, my three YouTubers, Maluka and Peter Hollins, formed kind of the core. Um, and then I also had, um, I didn't I didn't much use them on this one, but Ars Teether. And then Kristen was the new thing, playing her quartet of weird instruments. Um, and then I, my friend Noah has a buka horn, which is a Viking instrument made out of a hollowed out ram's horn that he had, de I delicately say, harvested just for the Banner Saga games. Um, and so um, one of the things with these scores is that most everything was multi-layered. So remember before how I, I showed you on Pathless that there was sort of duplicate folders. Notice I do the same thing here. It's the same exact thing, but it's for it's for layers. But a cutscene is not interactive, so it's just this. So we've got four flutes. Um, uh, it was four clarinets, but two clarinet parts. No, no, sorry, it, 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 two clarinets and two bass clarinets two dedicated bass clarinet, two bassoon and contra bassoon, and two baritone saxes. Cause, cause it's, you know, it's like a college wind ensemble, right? Um, and then for this, we had six horns, four trumpets, three tenor trombones, two bass trombones and two tubas. And notice like, I, I always want to make it clear to my orchestrator, um, like the chimbasso, this was just in case a mock-up needed that much more beefiness. So I, I, I made sure that it was obvious that that's not to be orchestrated. Um, and then we had timpani plus four in the percussion. Um, and so um, I always had to kind of keep an eye that I wasn't writing for like 50 people. Um, it's very easy to do that with samples by mistake. Um, and then there's some simple prelays of hammered dulcimer and stuff. Some stuff was done live. I did an additional session, like all this. Uh, uh, additional hand hand drum percussion was all overdubbed. And then I also had a few samples, mostly from things I tweaked, um, like here, you know, as a trumpet sample that I mangled to high hell. Um, and uh, so, but this like as a cut scene. You're hearing the final recording here. Trumpets and clarinet, aleatoric, quiet. So it's like a little intro to that particular scene. Um, and then here's like an establishing shot of the city that we're trapped in called Arborang. orchestra this is the kind of thing i would normally have put in the b orchestra except it's so short that i just like it's, it's fine it's just a few seconds but notice how heavily i'm leaning on the prelays of my singers and um and taylor um like i've got taylor down here and then i specifically requested on this score that she um use like a practice violin that she had as a kid so it's not this elegant sound it's supposed to sound kind of like this rustic, you know, and never play it perfectly in tune. So just kind of had to dig it out of the closet a little bit. Um, the only other thing that I did is there's a fair bit of um, didgeridoo and um, prepared electric guitar, uh, which were also done as um, not exactly samples, but I recorded them and I, I recorded them actually as part of Banner Saga 1 and just reused them for the next six years. Um, so here you can see I, I here's my raw didgeridoo. I, he, had, he brought a bunch of them in and they were like from here to the back wall and we recorded it where, you know, he, like one of them is on a low F. And so then you can see I've I've uh, I did some some stuff to it, and you end up with this uh, down here. Oop. Hey, why is that? 
interesting. Well, let's just change the outlet. That should work. Ah, come on, Zoom, making everything all strange and confusing. Well, whatever. If I play the mix, you'll hear it in there. I was just trying to give it to you isolated. thunderous thing down in the bottom. So here's where things get kind of unique to the Banner Saga. Um, here's the first combat queue um, where you're fighting off hordes of enemies at this wall. It's kind of like Lord of the Rings. Um, and notice I have all these notes. Um, um, and I don't actually even remember what muted trombones equals bass. I have no idea what that means, but it's possible that it means they're not in layer two they're supposed to be in layer one um and then notice like layer two marimba's tacit bass trombone oh yeah i i uh sometimes just for shorthand just to keep, save time these two tracks on trombone one are trombone one and two uh and then bass trombone is here as an example just like i leave notes because if i'm going fast um you know we got shit to do and then you'll see here uh, it says note winds should be marked louder than trombones in l1 only so here we've got the winds uh and they are if they're in l1 that means they play in everything because it's an additive system um in general unless i do things like marimba tacit on l2 but generally the idea is that l2 will always be layer two plus layer one. We're always stacking. The thing that we did on this, which was fun because on the first game I recorded in Dallas with an orchestra that had never recorded a score and they had no ability to do click tracks. So we did the entire score wild, which is partly why I used almost no synths and pre-records and stuff because I knew I basically wouldn't have any way to easily synchronize them. And as a result, um, I just kept that as a sort of defining characteristic of the Banner Saga games um even though i technically i mean we were at air on this one i could easily have have, have recorded uh in parts or however we wanted but I, I decided to keep it going so here's layer one of the combat and it's the stripped down version So you see, it's just this kind of two voice corral ish for, and the winds are, are dominant. That Remember how I wrote, um, uh, oh, I, by the way, I think I realized muted trombones equals um, the two bass trombones are playing muted, but I don't have a muted bass trombone sample in here. So the idea was don't put that part in the tenor trombones. I just realized what that meant. We are hearing muted bass trombone plus the berry saxes. Um, and there was a little bit of contrabassoon on the downbeat. So it's, you know, Barry Sachs is just the coolest. It's just this nasty. speaking of musical parameters was that combat in this game is um entirely turn-based it's like playing chess and the result of which is that if you make the harmonic progressions too rapid um they it feels like it's rushing you along so if i'm sitting here doing this kind of like it was really really distracting and so I realized that so much of the score ended up being these pedal points. Up. And I would start getting really elaborate in all the kind of counterpoint noodling over top, but keeping it very steady. Like 
and you see it just keeps stacking and stacking, but we're pretty damn consistently on this F. Like. So that's what's going on there. So then the way it works is, is as the battle progresses, the music has to ratchet up and ratchet up and ratchet up. So 18M C1 is the, uh, uh, C1 S1 is the first set of combat music and section one therein. So now having um, successfully kind of survived the battle until I'm winning to a certain degree, which we can calculate with simple arithmetic, we add in uh, the layer two elements. And the fun thing about this was that layer two is not tracked separately. It's a separate performance entirely of the same notes, but with people who were previously taceted, now not taceted. So you'll notice it's like a jigsaw puzzle. See how we have the low uh, 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 muted trombones actually were here. So it was, I, I misspoke before because I wasn't paying attention. It was tubas and bass trombones together, which is a sound I started in Banner Saga 2 and stuck with all these like, it's two voice chorales for two tubas and two uh, berry saxes. So we're doing that again here, the two berries, the two tubas, and then to which we add the muted uh, bass trombones. And then you can see we add the trumpets and then the horns. And then for the end of it, um, there's this uh, statement that before was just the tubas and to which we are adding the rest. Um, on top of that, the percussion was all the same, but now there's this big showy timpani part you see here. So if I add in layer two, you see, especially in the back half, um, there's a shit ton of stuff that's getting added that wasn't there before. So all that noodly stuff actually turns out to be accompaniment to these big melodic brass statements. And because it's a separate performance, I'm able to have everybody play kind of mezzo forte on the layer one version. And then layer two, we ratchet the whole thing up a notch. So even just um, sampling how it sounds here, like if I pull over the audio, you can see, and you see I had to cut the damn loops because uh, we were using F mod and it was very primitive in flash. Um, it, normally you wouldn't have to do this, but there's, there's my actual reverb tail on the loop point, but uh, um, here's the L1 version of that opening. Now, with that in your ear, here's L2, same thing except the added timpani, but everybody ratcheted up. You have to actually do what you're saying you're gonna do. It's just got m more sort of weight to it. So the idea is that it, it, it progresses and progresses and the battle gets more and more kind of
Um, and then. Notice that I'm missing the, I'm hearing a lot of flute madness and not seeing it there. And then um, as the kind of finale of all this chaos is, uh, let's see here. I think it's this one here. Same thing, um, but I get really overt with, you know, if so if I once again remove all the layer two business, um, you can see that um, it starts off with this big brass chorale. It's a recurring motif throughout the franchise, this. This sort of simple declaration. And then we begin the kind of, hell march as it were and big melodic statements all here entirely for for layer two because the idea is that you build up layer one you let it until it's at a breaking point layer two gives you the the thing that knocks it out of the park and then you transition so that you're not beating the player over the head with the part that's going to be most obviously looping so here it is as just layer one But um, but obviously we're we're completely we're completely leaving it out for the base layer performance, and then skipping like you can see the the earlier part as well. Um, it's a little hard to hear. One of the things that's funny about this. Let me actually get rid of the winds layer two for a second, so you can see. Yeah. So you see, before it was just doing that you know big very march. <clears throat> Um, and just letting that carry the day. And then I have this, this um, melody, this in the trombones all in unison. That's the red line here in the middle. So that's what you end up adding in layer two. So for the really loud, I'm able to tell, you know, the bass trombones really, really go for it when we're in layer one so that the march is just absolutely gigantic. And then step back a touch so that we have room for this huge melody. Uh, Thing takes on this dramatically greater amount of mass and energy. Um, and all it is is just re-recording the same thing with adding a few little bits and telling everybody, you know, now play louder. And then of course, you know, the simple, you know, like victory stinger for when you win. Yeah. Not 
victory celebration. Um, and so you can see the whole thing is, is put together um, pretty straightforwardly. Um, here's a bit with my um, prepared electric guitar, which was always fun. you do to prepare it all manner of horrible horrible things so it was it was a um wonderful friend of mine whose name is mike nemitz aka viking jesus who does uh he's a he's a metal metal guitar player and um he did a metal cover of journey called burning sands that i when i found on youtube i was like are going to work together, sir. And uh, so on, um, hold on, wait for it. I have footage of the prepared electric guitar session. Um, yeah, here we go. So here's, here's beloved Viking Jesus. Uh, adore him. And so I said, what do you think of the idea of doing this? me looking young and innocent. Just went uh, nuts. So there, there's him. And so, yeah, here's a little taste. And the culmination of this, by the way, was him sawing the guitar in half. Uh, then we decided, what if we went so, yeah. in half as a sound? The sound of you literally cutting through this thing. And he did. textural stuff, that's his guitar. This gives you a sense of it. So yeah, we did everything you can think of. We, we, um, um, we ran all manner of, of strange, um, sound amplifying and sound deadening things through it. We hooked it up to all matter stuff. The truth is it was like seven years ago now and I've forgotten most of it. I just remember that sawing it in half was hilarious because he didn't actually take all the other crap off the table. So all the, the half of the sound is all the stuff like vibrating on the table in response to the, the saw. And the recording is this chaotic mixture of the amp picking up the vibrations of the strings and losing its fucking mind. And on top of that, the table rattling itself apart. It was just gorgeous. Uh, I, I absolutely loved it. And, and similarly, I went back and I had like this 25 minute file that I had to um, categorize and I came up with names. So yeah, this one was airplane engine 2.2. <laughs> And actually, the funny thing is that even though this file is old, it probably is still, yeah, it's still linked to the full. Like you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm just cutting it. They, they, they sometimes go on for quite a while. Um, it was just awesome. Uh, it was, it was one of those I needed. I needed. I always try to find one or two kind of X factors that are hard to pinpoint in a score so that there's some sort of sound and and there's these characters the bad guys called the dredge that are um that are like these kind of stone or metal golem type character like golem in the sort of um traditional sense not in the smeagol sense and uh and they uh uh there was something mechanical about them and i thought it'd be interesting to sort of sneak a little bit of this in homage to that i just looked at the chat i see torin uh let's wrap this up cuna any questions and then yeah, we'll just pivot to we'll just pivot to the lessons. Also, it looks like Mary Claire has left us. Goodbye, we love you. She's already gone. Didn't hear that, so it was for you guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, questions. Roger also leaving us. Well, thank you, thank you for letting me weigh in on your writing. I hope uh, to hear the final mix. Thank you, Austin. Austin. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that was such a tremendous like overview of some really uh, important works there. So we. Can, we uh, we don't usually get that. Uh, so thanks well, for putting, putting that well, all together. Honestly, I don't normally get to share it because I'm not normally in a position to be able to screen share, you know, what 
your studio straight, straight out of my stuff yeah exactly yeah. like i would normally have to think ahead of time put it on dropbox make sure my laptop can actually open the file and that dp there is compatible with dp here and there's normally a million barriers to letting that happen and so i'm kind of i'm kind of feeling spoiled uh, by this approach yeah that's awesome this is like actually somehow like adding meaning to to what we can actually do yeah and, it's and share. like make you think twice about having me come in person ever again because <laughs> so might this might be superior so uh or 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 everybody just come down here you do like an expanded hey. field trip i got plenty of space and uh i see a sofa back there we could fit about got a know, sofa and a chair 50, and i have 50 students on that i've got yeah and i have about eight or nine folding chairs for the annual pilgrimage of the usc class uh, up here as well cool. um so yeah, any um, any questions? I know I'm I'm kind of glossing over lots of stuff, and I'm I'm highlighting just things as they occur to me, and and obviously also some of these files are years old. The the Banner Saga three, the one I just had open, is the newest, other than the the pathless that I began with. So it was the most in my head about what the hell I was doing at the time. Uh, but the Assassin's Creed and Abzu are both um, well, one is five years ago and one six years ago. Uh, so they are slightly um, rustier. I remember it by and large. But any questions of anything I may have glossed past too quickly or carelessly? Or did I skip the most interesting part and belabor the boring parts? What uh, What do you guys think? I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, how about we keep rolling here in the Zoom room? Um, and then for everybody who joined us on uh, YouTube, thank you so much for sticking, sticking with us and uh, uh, for partaking in this awesome master class. Um, feel free to check in tomorrow. We have another masterclass with Jonathan Snipes, the um, one of the producers in the acclaimed rap group Clipping. That'll be from two to four. Uh, you can find out more details about the TAC Online Festival at bit.ly slash sfcmtac. Again, thanks to Austin uh, and all the TAC students who came out today. Uh, hopefully we'll see you all um, once again uh, tomorrow. So have a great uh, evening. Ciao.